welcome to another episode of Wiggy Reviews. Uh, last time I reviewed The Martian by Andy Weir. Uh, if you missed out on that, I will place a link somewhere in my black chasm area voidness darkness whatever I'll figure out a name for it later uh, so you can check that out uh, this week since we're in the magical month of October my favorite month with my favorite holiday in it I figured I should review one of my favorite books that kind of has something to do with uh, Halloween question mark so, let's just jump right into it. This week I am reviewing The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. For those of you not familiar with the story of The Phantom of the Opera, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview of the plot. Uh, it takes place in Paris, France in the year 1881 in the world-famous Paris Opera House. Uh, the main focus of the story is Christine Daae, a young ingenue who has attracted the attention of the Phantom of the Opera, or the Opera Ghost as the company of the opera call him. Uh, and he has fallen in love with her and he teaches her how to sing. Uh, one day, Raoul de Vicomte de Chagny comes to the opera, sees Christine performing, and after much effort, uh, <laughs> meets with her, and they reminisce about their childhood, uh, but the opera ghost gets jealous, and when he overhears their plan to run off to get married, he gets angry, kidnaps Christine, and then Raoul must save her from the opera ghost. Basic plot. <laughs> um, now, a key factor in this story uh, is that the opera ghost is not a ghost at all, but a brilliant mad genius with a horrible deformed face described as similar to a corpse head or a death's head. Uh, and he must wear a mask to conceal his ugliness from the world. Uh, and, of course, everyone knows the famous scene of Christine tearing away the mask and him getting totally pissed at her for it. Uh, so, yeah, even if you don't know the full story of the Phantom of the Opera, you've probably seen a lot of TV shows, movies, comedians, uh, parodies of just that one scene because it's everywhere. Um... <laughs> And of course, it was made famous uh, in the 1920s by with the silent film Phantom of the Opera, starring the incomparable Lon Chaney. And if you don't know the movie, then likely you've heard of or you know a million people who have heard of the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. But we're not going to talk about the musical right now or the movie. I'm talking about the book that the musical and movies are based on. And I say based on because as with any interpretation of any book to ever become a film, a TV show, a musical, a play, a blah, 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 whatever, uh, changes are made. Changes are made sometimes due to budgetary concerns, time restraints, time constraints, um, in the case of the musical, it's because the guy who composed the music had a huge crush on the actress he wanted to see play Christine Daae, whom he actually married for a brief period of time before they divorced, and he kind of thought he was the Phantom. In my opinion. But that's something different! And we're not talking- and we're talking about Gaston LaRue's book that the musical and films are based on. So let's get right into it, shall we? Uh, I've already told you the basic, 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 basic story. Pretty simple love triangle of silliness. But let's get into more of the details. Uh, the story opens with a prologue, interestingly titled, in which the author of this singular work informs the reader how he acquired the certainty that the opera ghost really existed. 
That's right. Gaston LaRue opens the book claiming everything you are about to read is true. Though, of course, it actually isn't. But it's a familiar phrase we hear in fictional stories in order to open readers to the possibility of delving deeper into the universe of the world created by the author. So, the prologue outlines how Gaston LaRue researched the fantastical story of Christine Daae, Raoul le Vicomte de Chagny, and the opera ghost, and thus begins our story. The story beginning of the story comes during the farewell gala performance uh, in celebration of the retirement of the uh, opera house's retiring managers. During the gala performance, Christine Daae performs for the first time as a lead soprano and blows the audience away. And in the audience happens to be Raoul Vicomte de Chagny and his brother Philippe de Comte de Chagny. And after her performance, Christine faints, and everyone freaks out, and everybody rushes her, and Raoul, in a bus burst of passion, must see her, uh, and tries to speak with her in private, but she pretends she doesn't know him, telling him to leave. But of course, he, being so in love with her, stays and listens at her door, and actually hears a man's voice speaking to her, telling her she must love him. And Raoul waits until Christine leaves, and then he goes into her dressing room to confront the man, only to discover no one was there. Ooh. After that excitement, <laughs> we move on to the retiring managers, handing the opera over to the new managers. Uh, the successors are Monsieur Fermin Richard and uh, Monsieur Armand Monchamy who I shall refer to as Richard and Armand because French is hard. Um, the new managers learn pretty quickly that there are some pretty strange rules they have to follow uh, in order to keep the opera ghost happy, such as having to pay him 20,000 francs a month and leaving one of the private boxes, Box 5, available for his sole use. At first, they think this is just kind of a joke conceived by their prede predecessors to kind of welcome them to being managers. So they sell Box 5 and soon receive letters from the Opera Ghost warning them that they shouldn't neglect his rules or requests. Now, the story of the managers isn't really part of the main story, uh, but it kind of provides a little comedy to the otherwise dark plot. Uh, once they truly believe the opera ghost is real, they start doing strange things in order to find out who he is, how is he able to do these amazing things and terrifying things and things. Uh, and one scene in particular <laughs> where the managers are observed, uh, they're walking backwards, they're not letting anybody near them, they're just acting really weird and <laughs> it's... They ask for a safety pin at some point, and it adds, like, and it's oddly funny, because it all happens during this catastrophe at the opera. Uh, the, the catastrophe being Christine Daae's fantastical disappearance during a performance, but I, I'll, I'll get to that. Well, let's just go ahead and hop right into the main characters, shall we? Um, so there is Christine Daae, uh, the young ingenue who for three months has been uh, secretly taking lessons from the opera ghost to become a famous soprano star, sing for the heavens, and all this jibber-jabber. Um, and you're probably asking, how did she take lessons with this guy for three months and not realize he wasn't a ghost or that he was just a guy? Um, well, uh, in order, in order to explain that, I guess, uh, we have to talk about Christine's past. Uh, she and her family lived in poverty most of their lives, uh, her, but her father was a brilliant violinist and taught her to sing long before she learned to talk. Uh, and after her mother died, he, and he took Christine and they traveled across the country to find fame and fortune for his violin playing, uh, but sadly that didn't happen. Um, but they lucked out a couple, uh, a professor named Valerius and his wife, saw them perform and felt pity for them and took them in, and they moved them to Paris. 
Um, during this time of them moving to Paris, Christine's father starts getting weaker, he loses his strength, gets sick, uh, but he still continues to play his violin for his daughter and continues to teach her to sing, uh, and he also tells Christine the story of the Angel of Music. And he promises her when he is in heaven, he shall send the Angel of Music to her. So years pass, and eventually her he dies, uh, Mama Valerius enrolls her into the conservatory for the Paris Opera, and she is alone in the world. And so when she begins hearing a magic voice singing to her, and then the voice starts talking to her through the walls of her dressing room, that's right, through the walls of her dressing room, um, she believes it to be the Angel of Music. Uh, the opera ghost taking advantage of her innocence and naivete, uh, doesn't really say he's not, and he kind of plays the part of an angel of music. Um, the where does Raul play into this? I mentioned before that Raul and Christine used to be childhood friends. Well, Christine wasn't always alone with, with her father when they moved to Paris. Uh, they would go vacation back to their home, and one time on the vacation, a young boy rescued Christine's scarf from the sea. Scarf from the sea, if you did not catch that word. Uh, and he was so taken by the little girl, by the young girl's beauty, that he can, he, every summer, he visited her and her father, and he would listen to the stories, so he's familiar with the story of the Angel of Music, uh, and unfortunately, he they had to stop seeing each other because he a vicomte, a vicomte could never marry a poor girl of the opera. Um, so yeah, Raoul the Vicomte de Chagny, that is just so goddamn fun to say for some reason. Um, <laughs> he still loved Christine even after they kind of left but he lived but he moved in with his brother uh Philippe the Comte de Chagny and if you hadn't figured out yet Comte de Chagny means Count of Chagny and Vicomte de Chagny means the Viscount of Chagny yeah um and Philip Philippe Philippe uh loved his brother very much uh, he took over caring for him after their mother died when Raoul was born, and then once their father died and Philippe became the Count, he just kind of spoiled Raoul. He spoils him by taking him to the opera. All the time. They're always at the opera. Uh, it's there Raoul sees Christine for the first time since they left on such a sad note, like, oh, we can never be together because I'm rich and you're poor. Um, and... Uh, he constantly tries to get her attention, but she just kind of ignores him, or never notices him, or but he, do, but he doesn't give up because he's in love, and he loves her, and after he hears the man's voice in her dressing room, he gets extremely jealous and very determined to discover who is this voice talking to my love, and who has stolen her heart from me. Um, yeah. So that's those two. That's the two lovers of our story. Um, and... Before I talk about the next main character, who is the, <laughs> for which the book is named, The Phantom of the Opera, I must first speak of a different character who is almost always cut from every version. Except for the Lon Chaney version. Huzzah. Um, and the person I'm talking about is the Persian. Uh, the Persian is an important character, and it's a little bit of a shame that he's cut from so many interpretations, because he's very important. Um, the Persian, also called Daroga by the Phantom, knew the opera ghost uh, before he lived in Paris, before he became the opera ghost. Um, he actually used to live in Persia. Uh, but there's more to that story. We'll get to that. The Persian saved the Phantom's life, which is how he knows him. And when he hears of a Paris opera ghost, he kind of figures out, oh my god, it's it's the guy. It's my buddy. It's my friend. And he's the only one who knows the Phantom of the Opera's true story. And when he 
discovers the kind of love triangle going on between Raul, Christine, and the Phantom, he decides he wants to help Raul save Christine from the Phantom before he can do either of them harm. Now, <laughs> we get to the Phantom himself. Um, there have been a number of different backstories for the Phantom. He was a sideshow freak. He was... Uh, abandoned by his mother in the basement of the opera. He was raised in the basement of the opera because he because his mother didn't want anyone to know about him. Uh, there was an accident with acid at some point in his life. Uh, he's just a monster that's always lived beneath the opera. Blah 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 blah. Etc. 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 Et there's other. There's there can be any any number of reasons that people have said the Phantom is there. Um, but let's get right into the true story, and I say that because it's the true story told in the first story written of the Phantom of the Opera, the book by Gaston Leroux. Um, he was a genius, uh, and all the stories do maintain that. All the stories, no matter what version you see, they do maintain that he is a genius. He's a musical genius, he's an inventor, an inventor, he's a musical genius, he's an inventor, uh, he is frighteningly intelligent, um, but let's get, but right off the bat, the thing that we should probably mainly focus on is that he has a name. The Phantom has a name. He's not just the Phantom of the Opera. He's not like, oh, he's just a Phantom, 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 Ghost, 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 Ghost. No, he has a name, and his name is Eric. Not terribly exciting, I know, but still an interesting fact that many of the films and stage adaptations just happen to leave out. Why? Because, I guess, oddly enough, when you name the monster, they're no longer a monster. I don't know. Um, so Eric, where did he come from? What's his story? What's his true background story? Um, well, we aren't really given an absolute story. Uh, but the Persian tells us bits and pieces throughout the throughout the telling of the story by Gaston Leroux. Uh, he was born to two normal parents, who, when they saw his deformity, just kind of freaked out. The mother would refuse to let him touch her. Uh, she was the one who gave him his first mask, and so since he was receiving no love from his parents, he ran away as a child. Uh, he would travel from fair to fair, kind of being ex exhibited as the living corpse. Uh, and he eventually made his way into India and Persia, and he started learning magic tricks from all these touring shows, and he learned unique tricks from every place he visited, including strangulation from India. Uh, and then he built secret passageways and torture chambers in Persia. Uh, and just just to entertain and to show off that he can invent these horrible things that kill people. Uh, he was known as the trapdoor lover in Persia because he could make doors open without keys, he could make people disappear through them, he just kind of was like this magical being. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but of course, since he built these things that were meant to, you know, cause harm or like torture criminals or war criminals, those kinds of things, the, sul the, the sultan kind of was like, oh, thank you so much for building all these, but now you have to die because I don't want any of my enemies to have any of this stuff, so now you're gonna die. And that's where the Persian came in and saved Eric's life. He got him out of Persia, uh, and he found his way to Paris, and he actually built the Paris Opera House. He was one of the contractors for it, uh, and so... While he, like, while he was building it, he built his own little secret passageways through the opera house. He built his own home beneath the opera house in the catacombs. Uh, so, he, yeah, you learn a lot, but it's still, like, not extremely detailed. It's just kind of like he was here, then he was here, then he was here, then he was here. Um, but, yeah, so that's the Phantom, or Eric. No last name, just Eric. Um, and so... Let's just get into the love triangle, because now we have all three of them. Um, so the love triangle happens like this. Christine and Raoul have loved each other since they were children. Uh, when the Phantom speaks to Christine and begins teaching her, he tells her if she ever falls in love with someone, uh, he will go away to heaven. So she has to pretend that she doesn't love Raoul, that she never knew him, but the angel figures out that, oh, you know him, don't, don't lie. Um, and... 
Raul believes the angel is actually a man when Christine still thinks she, he's an angel and wants to confront him and fight for Christine's love. And when the Phantom learns of Raul constantly chasing after Christine, he decides to take her away and steals her after a performance. Uh, the infamous performance where the chandelier came crashing down, uh, which is featured also heavily in adaptations, even though it's a very short thing. Um, the Phantom reveals to Christine that he is not an angel, he is just a man named Eric, and that he loves her, and he weeps for her to understand that he did everything because he loves her, uh, and that she will learn to love him too, and he takes her to, he takes her to his home, and then the famous scene of her pulling the mask off and him unleashing his full rage on her and but she calms him down and convinces him that she loves him and he allows her to leave come and she can and she freely comes and goes uh and he eventually gives her a wedding band and says you have to wear this and as long as you wear this i will be happy nothing bad will happen uh but when Raul sees the wedding band, he gets very angry, and he tries to really figure out why are you getting married, and who are you getting married to? So she eventually breaks down and tells him all about the Phantom of the Opera, uh, tells him all about the story of Eric, uh, how he took her away, how she discovered who he was, and... So he says, well, let's just run away. He's just a man. And she's like, no, I can't run away. I have to. I promised I would sing for him. Uh, but he eventually convinces her that they should run away together. And they secretly plan an engagement. They secretly plan this escape. Unfortunately, Eric hears it. And he kidnaps Christine during the middle of a performance. And Raul has to doesn't know how to find her but the persian steps in and says i know where she is we can go save her that's all <laughs> um now uh now is the part of the review where i have to throw up a spoiler warning because though most of the book is told pretty accurately by interpretations uh the ending is kind of where everything goes crazy uh so if you want to read the book for yourself and don't want to hear about the the climactic ending uh skip ahead to my rating here's the link last chance better click it if you don't want me to ruin it for you okay we good okay um the ending of the book uh basically uh the persian and raul become trapped in one of eric's torture chambers and Christine can only save them by agreeing to marry Eric, uh, the Phantom, if you hadn't figured that out yet, uh, and promise to spend eternity with him. Uh, as the torture, as the tortures begin, uh, the two men trapped in the torture chamber try to find a way out. They eventually find a secret trap door in the bottom, and when they open it, uh, there's barrels full of gunpowder. And they realize, oh no, he's gonna blow up the opera house and kill us all if she says no! Uh, so Eric tells Christine that she has to choose by turning these two mechan- one of two mechanical, like, switches. Uh, one is the shape of a grasshopper, one is the shape of a scorpion. Uh, and she has a, a short amount of time to decide, and one blows up the barrels, and the other one drowns the barrels. Um, and as time counts down, he threatens to make the decision for her as she hesitates more and more and just kill them all. Uh, but she eventually chooses to marry him. Uh, water fills the torture chamber. Raul and the Persian start to drown because Christine and Eric suddenly disappear and we just think they're left to die. But of course they're not left to die because we have to have a happy ending. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, relatively happy ending. Anyways, uh, so... It turns out, we learn through the Persian's eyes, that Christine saves both men. 
um, by convincing Eric to rescue them, saying that she will be his living bride if he saves them. And he agrees. Uh, he sends the Persian back to his home in Paris. Uh, and the Persian, realizing that Raoul is still missing, goes to the police and tries to uh, put out a report and have them chase after Eric. Uh, but then he discovers that Raoul is missing, but the police are more preoccupied with the fact that Philippe, Raoul's brother, has been found murdered. <laughs> And their eyes are on Raoul, because it was kind of commonly known that Philippe did not approve of Raoul and Christine. I didn't get into that, because that was another added story thing that... I mean... I'm telling you now. Um, anyways, what was I saying? Oh yeah, um, so he returns from the police, and he writes down everything that happened, and then he is visited by Eric the Phantom of the Opera. He comes to see the Persian. He's like, where is Raoul and Christine? What did you do with them, you monster? And he's like, oh, whoa, calm down, buddy. Calm down. Um, uh, just calm down. I'm dying. And he's like, whoa, where's Raoul and Christine? Where are they? And Eric basically says, all right, look. After I saved you, uh, I couldn't let Raoul go because he was kind of, he was kind of what was keeping Christine with me. And I figured if I let him go, there was always a chance he could come back and save her. Free her from me. Whatever. Um, but, so he locks Raoul up in a, like, dungeon in the opera house. Uh, and he goes to Christine. And she lets him kiss her on the forehead. Now, that may not sound like a lot. But it kind of allows us to finally see how this character, this man who could so easily kill people and enjoyed causing many people uh, pain and suffering and he enjoyed causing mischief and he enjoyed, like he invented all these torture chambers and all this stuff. So he like <laughs> he liked killing people. He didn't really understand the difference between good and evil. Um, but with this simple act of her letting him kiss her letting him kiss her on the forehead just reveals how much of a tragic man he is. Uh, the simple act of her allowing him to kiss her like it makes him so happy he begins to weep. And Christine weeps because she understands that no one has ever shown him that kindness and she takes his hand and she says oh poor unhappy eric and he realizes pretty much right then like he can't keep her he can't have her um so he releases her and raul and even gives them the ring he gave christine as kind of a wedding present and he sends the lovers off um but before they go christine comes back and kisses eric on his forehead and he leaves, the, and it, oh, and ah, oh, ah, oh. and then so Eric tells the Persian all this, and ah, oh, it's just so sad. Uh, he tells the Persian all this, and he tells him that I'm dying, and he's like, I just wanted you to hear the story. I want you to, when I'm dead, put a message in the paper for Christine so that she can fulfill a promise she made me. And then three weeks later, oh, <laughs> Eric is dead. And, I mean, it makes the story so much more tragic. All he wanted was to be treated like a normal person. He wanted to live a normal life. He wanted to have a normal house with a normal wife. And, and he just wanted to someone to allow him the simplest things that we take for granted every day. He was shunned because of his ugliness. He was hated for his genius. And though he could be a monster or terrible person uh, one simple act was all it took to make him happy he just wanted to be normal and it makes it even more tragic when he says things like i kissed her and she didn't die you can hear the relief the sadness and, and the awe just in the words i mean it's so sad Ugh. 
different than the musical ending, but I honestly feel it's more powerful than the musical ending. I mean, in a musical, it was a full-blown passion kiss by Christine to the Phantom. In this, the simple fact she allowed him to kiss her was enough to bring him not only happiness, but just to tears because no one showed him that kindness before. And yet, even as he tells the story to the Persian, the Persian continues to refer to him as monster, continues to treat him as one, but when he hears Eric talk about that simple act, he pities the man and cries for him. And it's... Ugh! I mean, the love Eric felt for Christine was real, and even if he knew she could never and would never reciprocate the feeling... Now, if you've seen the Lon Chaney version, the ending is completely different. Um, I well, I say completely. Well, yeah, pretty completely different. Um, mainly because early films, especially silent films, had to tell the story with little to no dialogue. It was all action, and movies were in a period where generally, I'm not saying all, but Pretty much most movies about monsters meant that the monster had to die. Uh, so the ending changed to a mob chase, where the mob comes after the phantom in the catacombs and chases him to the river, and they corner him and they're ready to kill him, but then he reaches into his cloak and they're like, oh no, he's got a weapon, he's gonna do something horrible. Uh, and then he reveals. And he has his hand, and it's nothing, and then he laughs, and they grab him, and they throw him in the river, and they kill him. But in its own way, it's has it has its own tragedy. Um, the fact he has nothing in his hand, he doesn't have a weapon, and he's almost accepting his death. And with his laughter, he kind of says, You feared the idea of me, but all I am is a man. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but really, the simple scene almost touched on the same tragedy of the book. Um, yeah. Ugh. Sorry for the emoting and the yelling and the crying, but it's my favorite book. Um, so, now for my rating. <laughs> this is one of my favorite books. The storytelling is wonderful. LaRue knew how to weave an interesting story with the proper attention to details. The backstories didn't feel labored or just kind of thrown in. They were there to help accentuate the action, to help tell the story, uh, to kind of explain the characters. And speaking of the characters, though they may be kind of stiff compared to modern writing, I mean, the book was published in 1911 and it was a translation from French. So, you know, things get a little weird in translation. Um, the characters still, they, they still are able to show great heart and believability, and the writing style may be a little, the writing style may be too old uh, fashioned for some people, but I, I think it adds to the charm of the story, uh, especially with the continuing theme of, this is a true story. Um, the Phantom is a tragic character with flaws and his almost childish uh, behavior towards the violence he commits only kind of adds to the tragedy. Uh, uh, like, he doesn't understand the concept of good and evil. He just is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic story and it's obviously deserving of the title classic. So, I get Phantom of the Opera, The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux, one of my favorite all-time books, a 9 out of 10. Why? Because the writing style may turn people away. I, I, if I could read French, if I could speak French, I would love to just read it in the original French text. Uh, and the characters are products of their time, period. 
uh, I, in other words, you may not like how they act and what they say, but they are products of their time and they're French. Take that for what you will. Uh, so yeah, a nine out of 10. So thank you for watching Wiggy Reviews. Tune in next week to see what October has in store and I will see you next time. Bye.